Sorry, trying to keep Tanya. social order here. So um, let me go to you, Larry, and have your comments. And again, please feel free to raise your hands. Well, I, I think the whole Zuccotti Park thing raises um, two questions that I think have complete merit. One is that the economy over the last 30 years prior to the recession, in my view, acted like a huge skimming operation for the top 1%. And this was not by accident. This was not a failure of policy. This was the way policies are designed to work in this country. The second point is that we really have in this country a persistent high unemployment problem with unemployment as high as the eye can see. And the establishment, the powerful forces in our society, are essentially saying, we're OK, America. You're just going to have to tough it out. I don't see the urgency. I saw it from Gene Sperling, which I applaud. I haven't seen in the, in the uh, description of this conference or the description last year or in the discussions that I've seen today, any sense of urgency about the dramatic effect of the unemployment going on in this nation. We had 9% unemployed. That doesn't mean that 91% are OK. There are 16 17% that are underemployed in any month. Over the course of a year, one out of three workers will be unemployed or underemployed. In polls, uh, something like 42% of respondents say that they or a member of their family was unemployed in the last year. That's just unemployment. Another 38% in the polls will say that they or someone in their family lost wages, hours, or benefits. And there's dramatic loss of income, higher poverty, and it's as far as the eye can see. And I want to know, where's the outrage? Where's the urgency? This is not a matter of unbalances. This is a matter of dramatic uh, ill being uh, imposed on people with uh, people not really being responsive to it. And you Even this administration for two years took a pass on talking about and trying to do anything about jobs. Larry, and you find Zuccotti Park helpful in this regard. I think they have totally raised that issue. On the, on the income distribution side, today we have in the paper the Congressional Budget Office coming out with numbers showing that the top 1% uh, doubled their share of income. Uh, the Economic Policy Institute today has also released uh, a paper that I, I'm a co-author showing that the top 1%, I'm just going to give you a couple numbers just to illustrate. It's very easy to say where the income inequality came from. There is income from work called wages. There is income from owning capital called capital income. We had a dramatic growth of the inequality of wages. We had a dramatic growth of the inequality of capital income. And we had a shift towards more capital income and less wage income. And the consequence is that the upper 1% had their incomes grow since 1979 to 2007. 224%. The upper tenth of 1%, the 1,000th households, 390%, while the bottom 90% had 5% growth. That meant of all the income growth between 1979 and 2007, about 60% of it went to the upper 1%. That's income. I can give you more on wages, and I can give you more on capital income, where the top 1% doubled their share of capital income from around 38% towards around 60%. And wealth, the typical household has less wealth in 2009, the latest data I have, than in 1983, while wealth grew 48% for the upper uh, 1%. Now, this is not an economy that's working for most people. Okay, let me uh, just take that. I, I really, I want all these ideas to be out there. We have such a brief. Yeah, okay. But there's a person who just raised their hand right there. And there's one in the back of the room. Pardon I think I'll just try to go one between because it's taking a while to get through and, we, we're, and then go to Tara. But let me take this one question. And I know, was there a hand up in the back of the room too? I will definitely get to you guys after I speak to, after Tara has a chance to comment and after you. Yeah. Please, go ahead. The language of the 99% and the 1% has very much become central to this discussion. But when we look at the kind of wholesale changes of social justice that are being demanded by the people in Zuccotti Park, totally outside of the, the issue of the desirability of those changes and the degree to which they can be agreed upon, are they really something that the 1% can fund themselves? Or does this sort of thing require a much broader buy-in from a much broader portion of society? Go ahead, Larry, and then we'll go to Tara. You know, I, I don't think the whole issue is about 
taxing the upper 1% and giving money out to uh, the other 99%. Most of the income inequality that we have is not because of what happens within uh, taxes and transfers. It's what happened to pre-tax income, wages. It's the high profitability. It's the great realized capital gains. It's the fact that the wage inequality uh, was dramatically bad. The bottom 90% saw wages grow by about 15%. The upper 1%, 224%. Now, I don't know how anybody thinks that that can any way be justified uh, just flat out. And, uh, you know, so I think there's a lot of wholesale changes that have to be done. And I think it actually derives from a belief in laissez-faire policy that managed to, uh, it was practiced, deregulation, busting unions, lowering the minimum wage, uh, privatization, uh, maintenance of high unemployment, all sorts of things that really had the effect of eroding a good quality job for most people. 